Okay, so in this example, let's set up the exact same problem like we did. We have s of zero equals four at time one. Our heads at time one is eight. If the stock price goes down, you have a value of two at tails one. Um, again, the strike price equals five. So to get these, you end up with eight minus five. And at time t, we end up with zero because the call will expire worthless. So it's always zero for a call option. Um, this is equal to three, this is equal to zero, and we have to solve for the V of zero, which is the value of the option at time zero. Again, we know that the interest rate is 0.25, which the book tells you is one quarter. And in this case, we want to solve for the U and D. So U and D, a lot of people say, well, to make sure the first example, you didn't need it, it's a waste of time. However, you do need these, it's a conceptual soundness portion. U and D represents the probabilities in a risk-free environment. So this is risk-neutral pricing. Uh, we can discuss that in another video. But these are actually simple to come up with. If they don't give them to you, u is equal to s of 1 of h divided by s of 0, and d is equal to s 1 of t, which is equal to s of 0 here. So you divide these. Uh, in this case, we have s of 1 of heads is 8 divided by 4. So we end up with 2. This is our u. Uh, again, for the tails, we have 2 divided by 4. This gives us 1 half for our d. So now we would like to solve for our P's and our Q's. Uh, we're gonna call this P tilde, and we're gonna call this Q tilde. Uh, these are risk-free, I guess these are the risk-free probabilities. U and D are just these fractions which we'll use to calculate uh, the risk-free probabilities. P is one plus R minus D divided by U minus D. Uh, Q tilde is equal to U minus one minus R over U minus D. This is equal to 1 plus 0.25 minus D, which is 0.5, which we got from here. And then you divide that by U minus D, which is 2 minus 0.5. And this will come out to be 1 half. Um, if you do the exact same equation here, it's U, which again is here, this is 2 minus one minus 0.25 divided by two minus 0.5, and this again will give you one half. Uh, these will sum to one because they are probabilities of both up and down, so they should always sum to one, which is just the basic principles of probability. So in the book, there are a variety of formulas, but the one you need to know is 1.1.10, if you have this book, and this is going to be V of zero is equal to one over one plus R times P tilde, V1 of H um, plus Q tilde times V1 of tails. So in this example, we can quickly solve for this. So V of zero is equal to one over 1.25. This is multiplied by your P tilde, which again up here is one half, so 0.5, times the value at time one of the option, which again, if you look up here, is three. So this times three plus um, your Q tilde, which is 0.5, and the value of option for the tail is zero. And this equation will give you 0.8 times 1.5, which is equal to $1.20, which is equal to the value at time zero. Okay, so we would like to test this. There are a few other things we want out of this, Besides just, I'm sorry if I actually have that off screen, but there are a few things in this we'd like besides just the value of the option. We would like to replicate this. We need to know how many bonds and how many stocks we need to hold, just as in the other example. So in this case, we still need to know the value of the option, but we would like to replicate this using stocks and bonds to get the same value. So let's dive on in. So we know that the formula for delta zero, which is the number of stocks that we need to purchase, is equal to V of one of H minus the value of the option at time one for time t divided by the stock price of time one of h minus the stock price at time one of tails. 
So this is important theoretically to understand this formula. This is why I like to do things the financial engineering method and not the easy algebraic one. Um, understanding that the change in the value of option, which is the sensitivity to the change in the value of the option in respect to the changes in the value of the stock. Um, in this case, here again, we're gonna end up with three minus zero divided by eight minus two. And this will give you three sixths, which is equal to one half. So therefore you should buy one half of a stock. So in this scenario, they told us also that the amount of money you had at time one is $1.20. The value when you have heads is equal to uh, the heads price, which is eight times delta plus how much you borrow times one plus R, which is 0.25. Um, and this should equal the value of three of the option. Again, we can test this and use what we got in this example. In this example, we also mentioned that you would purchase half of the stock. So you still have eight times one half plus B times 1.25, and this is equal to three. This is four plus B times 1.25 equals three. You move the four over, so you minus four, you have negative one equals B times 1.25, and you end up with B equals negative 0.8, just like in the other example. Again, we can go back through the same process of plugging them in to the formula, which is you have your stock price for heads, times delta here plus what you borrowed times one plus R, and this should be your value at heads, and also you have S of T delta plus what you borrowed one plus R into the future value of T. So as you can see, the algebra here is nearly the same. They're the same way of getting to it, but when you use the more or less financial engineering method, which I'll call it, um, you can simply calculate the delta more directly without having to go through as much algebra. So why is this important? Why are the two methods different? How are they the same? When would you use these? Um, the first method I think is more simple. It's more algebraic. More people understand the first method because it uses two formulas. It just takes a subtraction, gets things quickly. It's easy to do conceptually so you understand and learn the problem. However, in practice and financial engineering, a lot of times you're programming these things to optimize uh, the speed of calculating out your deltas and your B here for how much you need to borrow. And as we get moving into the future with different financial uh, Greeks here, so we need to calculate the delta, the gammas, and the thetas. Uh, you can hedge in different ways here, and it's important to know these. So knowing these formulas here, for example, knowing that delta zero is equal to uh, the change, or the first derivative here, taking the derivative, um, the change in your value of your option divided by the change in your stock is useful. Uh, understanding this notation, this financial engineering notation, Yes, it seems cumbersome. Yes, it's confusing in class because they don't really explain it very well. However, knowing this notation, understanding it well will help you in the future if you have to program these into algorithms. It will help you understand, I think, the computation of doing discrete time and even continuous time as we move forward. As the notation will be similar, we'll use multiple approaches in discrete time and we'll change some of the notation to get to continuous time. That being said, if you are confused and you have no clue what's going on in class, which like myself happens from time to time or for most of your program, uh, you end up with understanding this method because it is simpler. The equations are the same. They just extract different pieces of information such as how to calculate your delta on its own. So anyways guys, I hope you like this. I hope this video is helpful. This is how you calculate out um, a one period discrete binomial model for an option pricing. If you like this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell button if you want more videos like this and the notifications. Anyways guys, thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. Thanks for watching my video. If you find it helpful, please like, share, and subscribe.